Hey everyone, it's Jim from Vowels and More, an online vintage tube store. And today in Tube Lab number 75, we're going to talk about the great 2022 tube shortage. Well, maybe it's a shortage and maybe it's not. We'll get to that. But first, caution everyone, electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult a professional technician when in doubt. So many tube retailers have been experiencing a run on their inventories. A run is an abnormally high volume of orders. You may think that would be a good thing for business, but it's not. Because what happens is I can't restock inventory as fast as it's going out the door. <laughs> One of my wholesalers said he was working 16 hour days to keep up. I worked all weekend and just managed to stay ahead of the orders. Thankfully, the panic buying has eased off. But what are we to do about this global shortage of tubes? Is it real? And will it ever end? Well, with roughly one third of the world's tubes coming from Russia, both vintage and new, that only leaves new production from JJ in Slovakia. And you know what I think of JJ tubes and Chinese tubes, which are even worse, um, and Shuan, the main factory in China, I don't even know if they're up in, in production yet. They, they had a fire and then they decided to move the whole factory. Now hopefully they had lots of inventory packed away in warehouses, but who knows. And then there's a whole bunch of um, uh, smaller, higher-end tube manufacturers, but they're their prices are crazy high and their volume is very low. So they really don't factor into this discussion. Um, and that leaves the vintage supply, which is what I specialize in. And it has been diminishing rapidly over the past two years as more and more people get turned on to how good vintage can sound. Okay, so what to do? Hopefully you've been listening to my advice for the past year and investing in spares. In which case you're good. Just take care of what you have and pick up spares for your inventory as you find them at reasonable prices. What if you're just getting into tubes? Are you too late to the party? No, but think carefully before buying equipment that uses the high demand tubes. On top of the list are the 12AX7, the 6922, the 6SN7. Yep, the 6SN7. I know there are still thousands of them around. I have a lot of them. <laughs> but the very high demand, best sounding 6SN7s are getting really rare. Well, not really rare. Getting rare. How about that? The EL34, the KT88, uh, and the 300B. And I'm sure I missed some types, but you get the idea. Instead, look for equipment that uses less well-known, but readily available quality tubes. Small manufacturers like Melotone Kits and others deliberately choose to design amps that use quality vintage tubes that are still available NOS, new old stock, NIB, new in box. Here's one of my kit amps that uses readily available, wonderful sounding vintage tubes. And yes, this is a plug for uh, Melotone kits and for the Yuri monoblock. <laughs> yeah, 100% plug. <laughs> but it's my channel, so I get the plug once in a while, don't I? Anyways, it's not really about the Yuri. It's about the tube choices that I made. So let's take a look at them. This is a very simple, pure Class A amp. It's got one driver stage, a single tube, and it's got one power tube, and that's it. Out, it, out, out the sound goes, and, and it's a wonderful sounding um, little amp. So, what's this driver tube over here with the two funny top caps on it? Well, right in the slot right now is the uh, Kenrad 2C22. The, the first number, the common number is CV6. 
Uh, and the, the tube has numerous numbers because it was such an important radar tube during the Second World War. Everybody made their own version of it. They're all essentially identical, though some test a little bit with a little bit more gain than others, but th that doesn't even matter for what we're talking about. And it doesn't affect the circuit um, in any significant way. So, what what is the most common driver preamp tube you can think of? The 6SN7, right? Yep. Okay, what uh, would be the tube that is one half a 6SN7? Ah, the 6J5. Uh huh. Okay, everybody got that too, I bet. Now, the 2C22 or CV6 is modeled on, yep, you guessed it, the 6J5. Now you know why I chose this tube. So not only is this basically half a 6SN7, basically, it's not exactly the same electrically, but it's very close. It's a better built 6SN7. It's, it's got top caps. It, um, it's designed for low noise. Um, I've tested hundreds of these things, mostly, um, you know, 70 year old examples from the near the end of the Second World War. And we'll look at one in just a minute. And they test beautifully. It's just amazing. And they sound great. And they're available, at least in the quantities for a small amp manufacturer like, like, like Melatone kits. Okay, what about the power tube? Well, it's also got a sexy top cap. And um, let's take a look at it. It's the ST type or shoulder type. Some people call them Coke bottles. I like this a lot, especially in the monoblock aesthetically. I think it looks fantastic. Take a look at the build. The build quality is absolutely excellent. It's got large, thin aluminum spacers where micas normally would be used. Um, and same with where the micas would be. They've used aluminum. And if you look at the plate structure, you may say, Jim, that looks an awful lot like a beam-powered tetrode. And it is, of course. Now, this tube was designed to be used um, in video applications, cathode ray tubes, as an amplifier. Um, but, uh, and I didn't know this, but my, uh, my son Charles sent me a note just the other day, and he said, Dad, did you realize that the 6P7S um, was modeled on the 6L6. And I said, oh my goodness, no wonder it looks like a 6L6 and it specs like a 6L6 and it sounds like a 6L6. Sometimes, man, anyways, if you don't know, you don't know. I mean, if you look at this plate structure, you know right away, this is in the KT88, it's in the KT77-6550 family, right? So it's not surprising that it sounds a lot like those tubes. And uh, the beam-powered tetrodes are well known for having a good punch, good bass, and good drive, basically. Um, they're not as warm sounding as an EO34, uh, but on the other hand, they do a lot of things really well. So everything is a trade-off in tubes. But that explains why I chose this tube, because there's lots of them available, they're not expensive, and they look great, so I mean, and they sound great. So why wouldn't you put this thing to use in you know a small production run like the Yuri? Okay, let's put that away safely. What else? Well, there's lots of options, but you could modify an existing amp to take a similar but more available vintage tube. And one example would be if you're running 12 AX7s. You could mod it so that it uses the uh, 6N2P. And there's a mil-spec version, 6N2P EV. And we'll look at those in just a minute. Basically, um, the 12X7 has a universal heater. And it can take 6 volts, 12 volts. has a center tap on pin 9. You can run it in series. Um, really, the 12 series is fabulous. You can do pretty much anything you'd want with the heater supply. Whereas the 6N2P needs 6 volts. <laughs> now there's a sneaky way to get around that, and we'll talk about that probably in a future tube lab. Um, but what I want to talk about, though, is that the 6N2P has, 
has a shield between the sections. It's a very low noise tube. It has the same gain and it basically is a drop-in replacement for the 12AX7 except for the heater voltage. And it sounds great. Now, way back in episode 18, I had I did a full episode on the 6N2P and I'll put a link below uh, so that you can go ahead and watch that. Uh, I think it's well worth considering. Now, that's just one example where you can take an existing amp with a, a tube that's difficult to find or difficult to... F I mean, 12AX7 is a very common tube, but finding the high quality vintage version is difficult now. Finding balanced match pairs is even harder. And it's hard on the pocketbook. They're not cheap, those tubes. Um, there's lots of cheap new junk out there, but you know that's not what we're talking about. Um, and you could, you know, probably for if 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 it's doable, you could you could either do it yourself or you can hire it out and uh, get your get your amp over to a tube um, that um, is much more affordable and available. And what that means, of course, is you can have a much higher quality tube in there than you could normally afford. So that might be a good path to take. And this is something people have been doing for years, so it's not a new idea. And in future episodes, I'm going to take every opportunity to offer advice on how to find affordable, quality vintage tubes. This is, it's going to be a big thing going forward, folks. This, it's, the panic buying is eased off, but the crunch on supply is just going to get worse over time. Unless we see some large manufacturers jump into the tube manufacturing business, um, this is just going to keep on going the way it is, basically. So, what's happening over at Melatone Kits? Well, Charles is working away on the headphone amplifier. He's got the designed output up to around 2 watts a channel which should be plenty to drive most headphones. Let's take a quick look again at the power tube. Now, let's see, I'm not sure if you can see the logo or not. You see the, the C with the ring around it and the two wings? That's the winged or flying C logo of Svetlana. And this is the, um, in Cyrillic, it's this 6 pi 1 pi dash EB, but Everybody calls this the 6P1P-EV in English. Um, this lot all came from 1984. I bought uh, a half a case lot. That's what was left, I guess. And um, I did some initial testing to find out if the emissions are, um, are close to uh, the paper spec that Charles had worked out, and they are. We're at the tube's actually testing slightly higher than we expected on average. And that's fine. Um, and, you know, when you build the prototype, you dial in the tube um, in the actual unit. So we just start off with a bias point that is, is close to what we think will be centered for our voltages. And we'll take it from there with the actual build. Um, these are really robustly built little tubes, though. It's on the standard 9-pin. It's basically the same size as an EL84. It's a little lower powered version than an EL84. It's a beam powered tetrode as well as the 6P7S. The vast majority of power tubes are beam powered, so there's nothing exciting about that. Um, and uh, if you look at the pins, these are mil-spec tubes. They're tinned. There's a very good chance that the heater has a higher spec on it, but nobody usually declares that in this, at least not in the in the data sheet. Most of the old data sheets don't talk about extended life heaters. Some do, but not very often. It's got a red dot on it. Now, what does that mean? That means that it's been accepted by the military at the factory. And testing has shown that these tubes are very tight, testing strong with no problems. So. Uh, the the factory inspection was a good one. <laughs> you can't trust all of these OTK stamps and things like that. But once you test them electrically, uh, you know, 50 years after they were made, if they're holding up well, then you know that in fact they were properly inspected. And that the, you know, Svet I've never come across a Svetlana tube uh, that I didn't absolutely love. They just sound amazing. Uh, it was such a loss when the factory closed down. 
Okay. So what came in this week? Well, let me clear the decks and we'll have a quick look. Let's get these up. And these, and I'm going to say the, the best for last. Now these are the 6N2Ps that I was talking to you about. These are all Voskhod rockets. You can tell because it's got the horizontal rocket ship. I believe that logo comes from the, the Space Age and they probably were supplying tubes uh, for the Soyuz program. That's my best guess. I'm hoping they weren't building ICBMs. Um, and if you're paying attention to what's going on, you'll know why I'm hoping that they weren't involved in that. But here's the shield. Can you see the right between the sections? There's a physical metal shield that goes to pin nine. And the benefits of that is that this is a twin triode, a high gain twin triode that's going to be prone to getting noisy or picking up noise. 12AX7 suffers exactly the same problem. The difference is we've got a physical shield, a metal shield that goes to ground. Pin nine connects straight to ground as quickly as you can. And that helps reduce crosstalk. So it's not surprising that these tubes are very low noise and that they have great clarity. And, and which is why I chose them to design the prototype phono preamp. And they just sound amazing in that preamp. And if I ever find time, we'll get the get the thing finished and and get it get it to the testers. Anyways. Um, I mean, the store is really busy. It's tough to find time for prototype builds. What else came in? Yeah, uh, and did I get a whole case lot? I got three quarters of a case lot. I think 150 tubes. A case lot for these is 200. So all same dates, um, which I love. And my customers love too. Uh, it's nice to get the same month, the same year. <laughs> um, a bunch of um, these lovely... East German RFTs came in and I've got more coming in. When enough of them are in, I'll test them all and hopefully we'll have enough to make up a couple of quads for the Wilsonton packages uh, because that's where the high demand is right now. People are waiting for quads for their Wilsontons. They're not going to go in the store separately. There's just too much demand from people that have that have R8s that need tubes, need good tubes. The R8 comes with tubes but we're not even going to talk about that. I threw mine out. That's how bad they were. <laughs> um, I think I threw them out on camera, actually. It was a long time ago. I forget. Okay, take a look at this. This looks like a reproduction box, doesn't it? Well, it isn't. This is an original box from May 1944. Accepted May 1944. That means that the U.S. Army Navy accepted this into their inventory at that point as meeting their specifications. The tube may have been made the month before, even three, four, five, six months before. But normally in a high production environment, we'd probably be talking about a month before. Um, they're designated as JAN, Joint Army Navy. CKR is just the Kenrad code for MILSPEC, I believe. Uh, and 2C22 is the type. It's the same as the CV6. It's the same as a whole bunch of other numbers. Um, I think the 7189 is another one. God, there's so many of them. But look down here. Kenrad Tube and Lamp Corp, Inc. That's the original company. And I believe it was actually set up in 1940, if I remember correctly. And it merged or got bought out um, by... I forget the date, but not maybe 10 years later, not that many years after it was formed, um, it ceased to be its own individual company. But in these years, they were running their own business and they were making great tubes. Some of the later tubes, I'm not so sure about, but the Second World War vintage tubes that I've seen are fabulous. Okay, let's see if we can get the box open. See how they knocked the corner down so that the bottom can't fall out? Why in the world can't we have these boxes again? They're just beautiful. Take a look at this. They put all of the patent numbers. <laughs> look at them all. I I don't know if you can read any of them. Anyways, they're, they're just, you know, 
match patent office numbers. Look how this opens up. Isn't that gorgeous? Now I've cleaned these tubes. When you get tubes that have been sitting in even a clean box in a warehouse for 70 years, um, they get covered in, in very fine dust. There's critters that love to eat the glue. There's a little bit of glue here and there in the box and maybe even in the fibers and they leave um, behind a film of junk. So it takes a few minutes to get the tube clean, but underneath is this glorious, perfect tube from 1944 in this case. Look at that. I mean, it's just absolutely mint. It's hard to believe that these still exist, isn't it? And what's even more amazing is that I'm still discovering tubes that sound great on the URI. Now I have this tube, at least with another number, but same, it's the same tube. If, the other number was probably used when they exported to a country that used that number. So I guess your text didn't get confused. Anyways, or that's how it was ordered. Who knows? Uh, and they sound good. In fact, all of the CV6 type tubes sound really good in the URI. And then I plugged these in and I didn't burn them in. Well, I had them running for maybe 20 minutes. And I put some music on and I thought, oh my goodness, I've got a new favorite tube. This thing sounds absolutely amazing. And we'll do some reviews maybe again on the tubes for the URI, especially if we have some more to, to look at. But basically the tubes very, it was very quiet. So the background is dead. It's, it's like um, looking off into space, total blackness. Um, and as a result, the detail was amazing. The detail is there. The uh, frequency response was there. Um, the tube just sounded, it sounded great. Uh, There's just no other way to describe it. I'd have to do a full review to try to come up with some more superlatives. It just sounded great. Um, as an audiophile, detail is something that I really cherish. So when a tube has that level of micro detail, I sit up and take notice. Anyways, that was a nice find. The, I, I, I don't have that many of them. Um, but, you know, maybe some will appear out of some warehouse, some dark corner of somebody's basement in the future. When they do, I snap them up and get them in the store for you. Okay, well, if you watch to the very end, here's some discount codes to help you out. And actually, I should talk a little bit about store pricing. I had a talk with my partner, Charles, a few days ago. And we've decided that we're going to try and hold the store pricing everywhere that we can. But some, some tubes um, have just, the wholesale price has just gone so up so much. The EL34 is going up in price. There's just no way around it. Probably the 6550. But I'm going to try to hold as many of the prices as I can. Uh, last week, or this week, I sold a bunch of tubes for less than I can replace them for. So that can't, <laughs> that can't be sustained. Um, so for half of what I can replace them for. Anyways, hopefully the buyers realize they were getting a great deal and understand when the tube price goes up significantly. Anyways, I've got flat rate shipping around the world at $20. And if yours is $150 or more after discount, the shipping's on me, folks. Have fun, everyone. This is Jim from Vows and More signing off. Cheers, everyone.